Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I'm starting a new project in this episode. It's a restoration of this Heathkit AV3. Let's get to it. So what is the Heathkit AV3? The short answer? It's an AC voltmeter with a large analog display. According to the Bob Eckweiler Heath Kit of the Month article, they were manufactured in kit form for about five years, starting in 1956. The main advantage the AV3 has over other general purpose vacuum tube voltmeters from that era is its large sensitivity range from 10 millivolts to 300 volts. That equals a 90 dB range. Pretty impressive and highly useful for its main intended application, the troubleshooting of audio equipment. With that sensitivity range, you can use the AV3 for everything from microphone outputs to preamplifiers and even high power amplifier outputs. Here it is taking a ride to my giant cake turntable, and on first examination, it looks to be in pretty tough shape. The case has a rough coat of paint that's clearly not factory original. The handle, the power cord, and the main control knob are all missing. There's two RCA jacks and a phono jack that have been added to the front panel. And most alarming, a long linear control, most likely a slide pot, has been added through a rough cut in the side of the case. Looking inside only adds to the bad news. It's been completely gutted. None of the original Heathkit circuit remains. No tubes, no attenuator, no power supply transformer. They're all gone. They've been replaced by a perf board solid state circuit that presumably runs on externally supplied DC power. The perf board contains two ICs, an LM386 audio amplifier and an LM324 quad op amp, and a handful of passive components. So judging by what I see here, more than likely this AV3 was modified to use as a microphone preamp or as a general signal level booster, likely to standard AV line levels. But of course, the nicest feature is the large analog meter. It was made by Simpson for Heathkit, and the text says full scale is 200 microamps. It's about four inches square, and aside from the slightly yellowed cover, it is in very good shape visually and still has crisp characters and gradations. This gunk here on the front is likely adhesive residue left behind from an old calibration sticker. Now I do know a little of the history of this AV3. It was actually my dad's. He was using it years ago when he was transferring old home movies from 8mm format to VHS and then later to DVD. And if you're familiar with that old format, it did not have an audio track on it. So I would imagine he was using it to monitor the narration that he added. Now I seriously doubt it was in pristine condition when he got it. Knowing my dad, he probably only paid a few bucks for it and it likely was already stripped out internally and he would have designed and built that perf board to suit his specific need. Before getting carried away with grandiose restoration ideas, I first need to confirm that the meter still works correctly. Starting with the mechanical zero feature. Here I'm just using a small screwdriver to gently turn the adjustment screw back and forth and it appears to be working just fine. For now, I'll just get the needle close to zero. I'll do a final zeroing later. The next test is to confirm the linearity of the meter. What I want to do is apply progressively increasing current up to the 200 microamp full scale and compare the meter reading to a reference ammeter of sufficient accuracy. So for this test, I'm using my trusty Keithley 177, which I previously checked against a calibrated lab instrument and know its accuracy. The best way to do this test is to use an adjustable power supply with a current limiting resistor in series with the meter, I use 68K in this case, and adjust the voltage to make the needle align with the scale every half a volt and then record the Keithley reading. This blue line here is what the data looks like with the meter readings from zero to three volts plotted on the x-axis and the microamps as measured by the Keithley plotted on the y-axis. Now, if the meter were perfectly linear, I'd expect to see a straight diagonal line and that's pretty much what I've got. There's no gross loss of linearity. To look more closely at the data though, I first need to make an assumption for the full scale reading at 200 microamps. This meter does read slightly above the 3 volt mark, but nevertheless I'll make the assumption that 200 microamps corresponds to the 3 volt mark. So based on that assumption, I'm able to calculate the error as a percentage of full scale, and here's what that looks like, represented by the orange line. 
at about 1.4% max, that error is pretty good for an analog meter with no parallax mirror, but again, those calcs are based on an assumption that 200 microamps corresponds to 3 volts. If I change that to 197 microamps to more closely match the actual data, then the error drops substantially. I can certainly calibrate it to whatever current I want for full scale, but I don't want to lose track of the fact that this is not a laboratory grade meter, and even my Keithley data will have some error in it. So all things considered, this Simpson meter is tracking plenty accurately enough for this application. The last check for the meter is to see how smoothly it moves. That's easy to do, just vary the voltage and watch the needle for any sticking or hanging up. Looks like there's no sticking issues, so all in all the meter looks to be in really good shape. Alright, now that I know that the meter is working fine, I can put together my repair plan. First and most obvious requirement is of course to get it working back to its original function, namely measuring AC signals over a wide magnitude range and covering at least the audio frequency spectrum. Now, I don't have a meter at present that can do that, and having that kind of a tool will be very useful for projects like that simple HF receiver that I just finished, where I really needed to tune the audio section and being able to see the response on an analog meter is a big plus. It also goes without saying that an analog display is much nicer than a digital display for tuning circuits, since many times you're looking at a qualitative change or a transient condition. But on those occasions where I may actually want to measure a quantitative change, the meter does have a logarithmic scale in addition to the linear scale, which is really nice for tuning a circuit for a relative drop in dB. So that's the first and most obvious item on the scope of work, restoring the meter back to full functionality. But does that mean repair it back to its original construction, vacuum tubes and all? Yeah, no. Not going to do that. That's clearly too expensive and really wouldn't be worth it with a meter in this condition. What I'm going to do instead is repopulate its innards with a solid state amplifier that's able to drive that 200 microamp meter. And I'll go through that design here in a moment. Next up is to rebuild the input attenuator. That's necessary in order to get that large of a sensitivity range. Luckily there's a decent 12 position rotary switch in the unit. I checked it with an ohmmeter and all positions test good. I don't think it's the original, but nevertheless I think it'll work just fine. And just like the amplifier, I've also got a design in mind for the attenuator and I'll go through that too in a moment. Rounding out the scope of work are all the cosmetic issues. This includes little things like the missing handle, which I'll probably design in 3D print, but also more challenging items like fixing the gash in the side of the case and cosmetic repairs to the front panel and possibly the clear meter cover itself. Okay, on to the new amplifier circuit design. Now, I'm not nearly clever enough yet to create such an amplifier design from scratch, but fortunately there are several good ideas out on the internet. Now, most of those ideas are, not surprisingly, built around an off-the-shelf op amp or two. But the one I ultimately decided to try here is a design created by Rod Elliott, who's kindly allowed me to feature it here on Level Up Double E Lab. The content comes from his project number 16 and application note number 002, which you can find at his website at the link I'm showing below. Now, Rod provides a very detailed function description on these two documents, so I'm only going to go through the highlights here as I jump now over to my KeyCAD circuit implementation. There's two gain stages. The first stage is provided by Q1 and N-channel JFET. Rod's design uses the 2N5459, which unfortunately are now pretty hard to find. So I did some data sheet comparisons, and based on key properties that Rod recommends be followed, it looks like the Toshiba 2SK879GR is a close enough match. This first stage maintains a high input impedance, as well as adding a gain of about 15. Moving on, Q2 through Q4 make up a simple 3 transistor op amp. Rod's design uses the BC549 and 559, but I think I can use the MMBT3904 and 3906 here. If you're not familiar with those, the MMBT just means it's the surface mount version of the through-hole 2N3904 and 3906. The only other modification I've made to Rod's design is with Trimmer Pot RV3. This is the adjustment that determines the full scale current the circuit can drive and is the only thing that gives me a bit of concern. 
That's because the maximum this circuit can drive is around 300 microamps, and to get to even the 200 microamps that I need, I have to drop this variable resistor down from the 1K in Rod's 50 microamp design to just a couple hundred ohms, and I think the adjustment is going to be really touchy. Just for some giggles, I built this amplifier circuit in LT Spice and ran a simulation. My main purposes were to see just how low I'd have to make RV3 in order to reach 200 microamps at the meter, plus I wanted to see what the frequency response might look like. From the meter testing I showed earlier, I know the effective resistance of the meter is around 1300 ohms, so I'm modeling it as just a plain resistor. These four diodes are germanium OA91s, which are necessary for high speed switching and low forward voltage drop, and fortunately they're still present on my AV3. These three plots show the responses for a 3 millivolt peak input at three different frequencies, 1 kHz, 10 kHz, and 100 kHz. I can hit 200 microamps by setting the sensitivity resistance to around 150 ohms. So that is encouraging, but like I said earlier, it is a sensitive adjustment. The response looks consistent over this frequency range, but I'm being cautious about reading too much into that. Rod repeatedly emphasizes that stray capacitances will wreak havoc with a high gain AC amplifier like this, and I don't have that effect included in this model. But this model at least confirms that this amplifier is directionally correct. Now, because this amplifier is designed to generate a full-scale meter response with just 3 millivolts of signal input, there has to be a variable attenuator ahead of it to knock down the higher level signals. So here's what it'll look like, and this also is straight from Rod's Project Number 16 publication. It's just a simple resistor divider network with a DC blocking capacitor and a high resistance input shunt resistor. This is the low Z version of an input attenuator from project number 16, and it has an input impedance of 214 kilo ohms and an upper frequency limit of around 80 kilohertz before significant loss of linearity. That's not as high as the 1 mega ohm and 400 kilohertz values obtained by the original AV3, but both are acceptable for the circuits I intend to use this meter for. Now, Rod does describe a high Z input attenuator design that has a much higher input impedance of nearly 2 mega ohms and is able to maintain accuracy to upwards of 250 kilohertz. However, I don't really need that extra frequency headroom, and the design requires adding a bunch of high tolerance and oddball value capacitors, so that's not really worth the extra effort for what I need to achieve here. At any rate, both attenuators have 9 steps from 3 millivolts to 100 volts. That doesn't correspond exactly to the 10 steps of the stock AV3. It goes from 10 millivolts to 300 volts. But I'm fine with that range, especially to add 3 millivolt sensitivity, and I don't really see where I'd ever need to measure 100 volt and 300 volt audio frequency signals. Now, I will have to change the scale graphics on the front panel to match this new range, but I have to repair the front panel anyway, and I might just as well start with a clean slate. So that's my plan. Hopefully I'm able to bring this guy back to life and have a new useful tool in Level Up Double E Lab. Now, at the time I'm recording this episode, it's only a few days away from Hamvention 2022, and for sure, when I'm going through the flea market, I'll be looking for an old AV3, maybe one that's in good cosmetic condition, but, but's missing the innards or maybe has a bad meter, I can do a quick part swap. That would certainly be preferable than trying to you know weld up or otherwise fix this gash in the case. At any rate, thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode and please do tune in for the future ones as I repair this AV3. So until next time, bye for now.